بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى الدين أما بعد. Originally my plan was we will go into more details but we'll make it short inshallah and as far as remembering it will be something that you may start worrying about from now on that I don't know if I will remember all of this information so this is why I really would like to make it easy on everyone and by telling you don't worry too much about it everyone will be doing the similar type of things there's only some things that we will have to keep in mind that is so that we won't make a mistake and for those things inshallah as we are together we will be helping each other with it inshallah so inshallah everything should be smooth and easy as we are getting ready to leave first thing we should realize that we are going to perform a great ibadah and it's a type of ibadah for which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam promise total forgiveness from all sins al hajj al mabrur laysa lahu jazaa'un illa al jannah this is the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the hajj that is performed in a proper way full of reward mabrur bir means reward a hajj that is full of reward has no reward except jannah which means allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam are guaranteeing jannah for a hajj that was done properly and this tells us how important it is for us to make sure that the hajj is done properly that is full of reward where you perform the hajj and you perform it in a way that is full of reward avoid all kind of sins all kind of wrong doings in hajj let me tell you one thing with experience that we have from going for hajj and that is the number of people that make mistakes in hajj regarding the orders and the ahkam and of hajj of how to do things and how not to do them there are very few in number comparing to those who lose their hajj because of their behaviors or because of their dealings i will tell you this believe me i have seen large number of people making this mistake and not even worrying about it and then when they make the other mistake of where they will have to have to pay a dam or something they really panic oh i have to pay a dam whereas that mistake is much less than the other mistakes people normally make because at least when you pay the dam 120 dollars you made up for it the other one there is no way it's gone once it's done it's gone is had this hat is not mabrur anymore which simply means say for example a person was doing tawaf during tawaf he missed some of the sunnahs of tawaf what are we going to say this person's hajj is not mabrur no he made a mistake in the ahkam of the hajj he may make a major mistake he did not do the rami when he was supposed to do it he missed the rami on that day we will tell him you have to pay them for it is hajj is this hajj is out of the category of mabrur no he made a mistake sharia told us how to make up for it but this person got into fight let him pay 100 dam no way that's it all of your trip from here to there coming back and all the struggle and everything everything is gone so this is what we have to keep in mind mostly the mistake that people make much larger than the ones who will make mistake in the ahkam of hajj the larger mistake people make is in these type of things this is why when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about hajj in quran al karim he did not tell us all the details of the rulings of the hajj but he mentioned faman farada fihin al hajj hajj is in certain months whoever makes that hajj fard which means he takes it upon himself to do it fala rafath 
ولا فسوق ولا جدال في الحج. He mentioned three things. He said, make sure you don't do these three things. What do these things mean? Rafas, fusuq, and jidal. Rafas means talking about intimate relationship. About to be more open so that we know the ruling exactly. Any of type of sexual relationship. Any of that type of talk or relationship, it's rafas. With any of those things, the hajj is out of the category of mabroof. This hajj is not mabroof. The second thing is fusuq. And inshallah, as we will go along, we will talk more in, about these things. There are more details to it. But fusuq means a person talking about any of the evils. Oh, did you watch that movie? And you would see people sitting in Mina, this is all they're doing. Because they don't know what else to do. <coughs> so, this is Fusu, talking about sins. Oh, you know that family? Oh, in our back home, there are people that come to masjid, but they are evil people. SubhanAllah. He's sitting in Mina. He's sitting by the Kaaba. So this is all Fusu. Talking about sins, about evils. And number three, jidal. Arguing, fighting, disagreements. This is jidal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned these three things in the ayah. Why? You would notice it as you would go, you would see why. Really, no matter how much I would explain at this time, you may not be able to understand what I'm saying until when we go over there and we see that... How much people are busy in one of these three things? So, in order for us to really make good use of all of our time and effort, and I don't say money because it's nothing comparing to the ibadah that we are performing, regardless of what we spend. So, in order to make a good use of this time that we are putting in, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we, may ha we, have to, we have to make sure that these three things are taken care of properly. Because once these th three things are such, once it's done, it's done. Nothing that you can do to make up for it because you can't reverse it. Other things, for example, in salah, there are certain things, you, someone ate something in salah, is eating a major thing, Normally, normal situation when you eat is not a major sin to eat. It's not even a sin. You eat halal food. But in salah, if you eat, salah is gone. Now you do hajj so do it ten times. It's not going to make up for it. But you didn't eat. You did some other mistake, whereas you didn't perform Surah Al-Fatiha. If you tell someone that you didn't recite Surah Al-Fatiha in salah, he will say, Subhanallah, you did salah without Surah Al-Fatiha. How can you do it? And he will recite hundred hadiths to you. But if you missed it, there is Sayyid Sahu over there. If you talked, if you ate, there is no Sayyid Sahu that can make up for it. So there are certain things, after doing them, you cannot reverse it. And these are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned here. They are the things that we really have to take care of the most. That's number one. And the reason I mention this is not... So that I would remind you of how to behave later on, or, well, uh, that's not my way uh, at all. My main thing of mentioning it here is because as we go for Hajj, and it's the ibadah where all the sins get forgiven, except for the rights of people. These are the rights of people. So what we need to do is before we leave, we should try to make sure that if there are people where we had differences with, we had some harsh way of dealing with, uh, we should try to contact those people <coughs> and ask them to forgive us. Because once this side is, is taken care of, the other side is promised, will be taken care of by performing the Hajj. But that will be the other side. This side, no. It has to be only through people who we had that type of dealing with. So, Hukuk al ibad Before we leave, we should try to make sure that we get these type of rights of people forgiven 
so we don't get into these situations once we are there. Then, do a lot of istighfar. Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from now on. Get into the habit of repentance. Those are the, really the hajj is the ibadah of three things. Three things that, we will be, that you would need to do the most over there. Istighfar, which means repentance to Allah, seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. Number two, dua. Mean thing of hajj. To make dua, a lot of dua. And you would see people getting bored by making dua after five minutes. In Arafat, I have seen people, they raised their hand for five minutes, then they left it. Because he thought, that's too long. So we need to get into the habit of making dua. Number three, dhikr. These are the three main ibadahs of the whole trip. Istighfar, dua, and dhikr. And this is what you see, labbayk Allahumma labbayk. It's dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then, what are we doing during tawaf? The dhikr of Allah and making dua and istighfar, all three of them. In sa'i, what are we doing? This is the same thing. Tawaf is a great ibadah. What we do? This is what we do. In fact, many of these scholars have written in their books that even reciting Qur'an is not good during tawaf so that you do the dua and you, do the, uh, you keep on praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do the repentance. Sa'i, great ibadah. We won't be able to do it once we go leave that place. But the same, it's the main theme of the ibadah, the ruh of the ibadah is the same thing. Dhikr, dua, istighfar. We're going to spend so many days in Mina, Arafah, Muzdalifah. What is the main thing over there? Are we doing anything special? The special thing that we're doing is the normal thing that we can do here. And that is Dua, Istighfar, and recitation of Quran and Dhikr. So these are the things that we will be going through throughout the journey. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. This is the main theme of the whole trip. To make use of our time, the best use of the time, and it would be through making it through these things. Istighfar, dua, and dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason I'm mentioning these things in detail at this time, or in somewhat detail, because we need them from now on. Things that we will need them later on, inshallah, we will talk about them there at the airports and the plane, where I was, inshallah, we are, we will talk about them, inshallah. So, now, asking people to forgive their rights, inshallah, then repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness so our hearts get clean. And once that happens, then as we go over there, our heart is ready to receive the rahmah and the nur, to see the nur over there. When the heart is clean, you would really see the nur over there. And especially when a person arrives by the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the place where the wahi used to come day and night. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to go around the same house. And he was seen doing the same thing that we would be doing at that place. You know, it's ibadah that he would be performing in the same place, same way where Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had done it. Very special thing. Very special gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, we need to clean our souls in order to really get what we are supposed to get from there. To receive the Rahmah and receive the Noor and receive the Barakat from that place. Then, as we are getting ready to leave, start thinking about the trip and purifying the intention that we are going there only to connect ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This should be the purpose. We are going to establish our connection, strong connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We would like to bring some change into our life. I have been living like this for years and years. I can't afford to live like this anymore. I have been too far away. People are so close to Allah and subhanAllah, I live among the same group of people. I'm too far. How can I afford to be so far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There are people like me. 
And they, were, they have all the other commitments of the life as I do. But they're so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all of this. So here is a chance for me. And it's a chance of my life. Let me establish that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and bring the changes. While being over here in the same atmosphere, in the same uh, routine of my, my daily routine, I'm not able to bring the change into my life. So let me go out and I will go to the best place I can go to now. There can't be a better place. I'll go to that best place to inshallah bring that change into my life. With this commitment, now with the firm intention, leave that inshallah I would like to bring the change in my life. Now, one more thing that is very important and extremely important. Remember, from the time we leave and until we come back, and inshallah it will continue, but this for this journey. The whole trip is only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fi sabilillah. So, as we donate things in the path of Allah, you donated hundred dollars, those hundred dollars were given to the masjid and they were used by the masjid. Now, from the Sharia point of view, although we don't even, many times we don't keep that into consideration either, and that is we have no right to say what to do with these hundred dollars now. Oh, I paid hundred dollars, so therefore open the must at three o'clock for me. So, <coughs> once we give that, something is waqf, is gone. Okay? So, same thing for this period. Make an intention from the time that we are leaving on the 25th until the 14th, everything that is that I am, my body, my feelings, everything is waqf to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> When people used to go with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the battlefields, that was waqf, that's it, it's gone. Inna Allah ishtara min al mu'mineen anfusahum wa mu'alahum. Allah has bought the wealth and the lives of the believers from them. And in return, He promised them the Jannah. Give me this, I'll give you the Jannah. Make it waqf. What does it mean? Someone push it me, pushes me. This is waqf to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm not going to say nothing. I have made it waqf. Waqf means I have given it totally. If Allah takes the whole thing, I'm, I, have, I have given it to Him. Now He didn't take the whole thing. He just got someone to push me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries us too. And who knows, this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That this person who was talking so big throughout the year, so many lectures. Now one person pushes him and he goes out. There you really see what's Imam, what all of those lectures meant. Someone says one word to you, and you blow up. This shows that all of our talks and everything else, that we should do this for thee, and we should do this, that for thee, and we should have people sacrifice this, sacrifice that. See, we are slaughtering animal every year. But that will be really seen during the journey. And sometimes people really, when you get into a situation where you see people will start slapping each other. And it gets worse than that. So uh, it's only, it's all about, as I said, making everything work. This whole thing is work. What me, what's me, I'm nothing. If a person throws me away, it's just like throwing a rock away. I'm not going to worry about it. One of the scholars on the day of Eid, and you know the day of Eid, you take a shower, you put the nicest cloth on, perfume, everything. And he's going to perform Salat al-Eid and he's the scholar of the town. While he's going, someone throws a trash from the window. Straight on his head. Spoils all of his clothing and everything. Right there on the street, he goes down in sujood. Ya Allah. I deserved fire coming and burning me with the arrogance that I had in my heart. The way I was walking today to the place of Eid, that feeling of mine should have brought fire, and this is only dirt that I can wash with water. This should be our feeling. Whatever I get, I deserve more than this. But Ya Allah, with these minor things, you are just letting me go with it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith considered this to be the jihad, hajj. And in fact for women, 
when they asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, we can't go out for jihad. He said, Jihad, kun al-hajj. Your jihad is hajj. <coughs> and with, subhanAllah, you look at the history of hajj, and you would see throughout the centuries, people are trying to make every effort to make hajj as comfortable as, as possible. Subhanallah, with all of these means of comfort that are being introduced and then people are paying for it and they're trying to get it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open some other door where we will have to go through some difficulties. And with all this comfort that we have in the days of Hajj, forget about how people used to do Hajj at the time of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or even at the time of Tabi'een or Taba Tabi'een, or I won't even say about 50 or 100 years ago. I remember in our childhood when we used to go for Hajj. You want to use the bathroom, make a hole, and get two bricks and sit on them. Yes, this was in our childhood. This is how we used to go and do the Hajj. There were no bathrooms over there. And still, there are people who have to go through this. And Water, the most expensive thing that was over there. You won't get people fill the small bottles of water, they keep them with them. And I remember, we used to keep it in our pocket. Sisters are keeping it in their pocket. Ask me for anything, but don't ask me for water. <laughs> you want hundred dollars, I'll give you hundred dollars. But don't ask me to give you a sip of water. That's my wudu, that's my drink, that's everything for me. If, I get, if, if I'm out of water, simply means now I have to go for miles looking for water. Yes, and this is I'm talking about in our childhood. We went through all of this. And now you go over there, subhanAllah, three years ago when we went, I, I said, subhanAllah, in Arafat is raining. And later on we find out, no, they have put some sprinkler system so that people will have some cool and it looks like it's raining, but it's not rain. It's art artificially raining. It's the sprinkler systems over there. And trucks full of food, ice, water. People are distributing it for free. And we have to really also appreciate what people are doing. SubhanAllah, normally we talk these Saudis are this, Saudis are this, but you would see over there, as you'd walk on the side of the road, you would see trucks, these big trailers are parked, and people are just throwing the food, throwing water, throwing ice, throwing yogurt, milk, just throwing it, and people are catching it while they're walking. And they see you walking far, they'll throw it over towards you. And we just receive it and we take it. Great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of that is donation from people in order to earn their reward and subhanallah they are making they are making good business that's the best business better than the ones that are selling for sure because they are doing their business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is providing people with water and with food at the time when they really needed the most and when they are going to be doing their ibadahs great ibadahs they are giving it out so alhamdulillah you know there and facilities are there you know bathrooms and now even Almost most of the bathroom, they have a shower in them. And most of us, what we do is, you go use the bathroom at the same time, take a shower. So, when you take the shower, then everything is clean. Uh, while you're taking the shower, the bathroom gets clean and everything, and then you are clean too. So, a lot of facilities. But with that, some hardships are there. And always there are some doors towards hardships. As I said, as you were just hearing, wait. For many people, really, hardship is waiting nowadays that we have to go through. And for us, waiting, it's a big hardship. For many of us, we are not really used to waiting for too long. Except if you have too many doctor's appointments, then you get used to it. <laughs> so, uh, and what is this waiting? As I said, if we make everything waqf, everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then our time since we left is all in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether we sit in our hotel for eight hours or we sit on the street for eight hours, it's all fi sabirillah. It's all in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
All we need to do is make the use of the time. That's it. Make use of it, whether we are in the hotel or we are, whether we are on the street. Wherever we are, we are on the plane, we are on the bus, we are on the airport, we are on the stations, we are on the street, we are in the crowd, we are stuck. Whatever. whatever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows our situation, our intention, and what we are out there for. So, all we need to do is make the best use of, the, of this time. With these few reminders, let me quickly go over the method of performing the Hajj. We will leave from here, inshallah, and in Frankfurt, we will have our transit. Keep your ihram with you, because you will have to put your ihram on in Frankfurt. When we are putting the ihram on in transit, make sure that we are not putting the ihram of Hajj on. At this time, we are only be putting the ihram of the Umrah. We are putting on the haram of the Umrah. Make, don't make the intention of Hajj at this time. There is three types of Hajj. One is called Hajj Ifrad. The other is called Tamattu. The third is called Quran. Don't worry about the details of all of these three <coughs> methods of Hajj. We will be doing Hajj Tamattu. Hajj Tamattu simply means you perform Umrah during the days of Hajj. What are the days of Hajj? The... Uh, Standing right after uh, uh, as the uh, Ramadan is over, then what's the month? Uh, uh, Shawwal, the Qada, and ten days of the Hajjah. Two months and ten days. These are the days of the Hajj. So, standing from the month of Shawwal right after Eid, someone can put on the Haram and start his journey. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, that, given us that time because it's a journey that needs a lot of preparation. So people used to leave and they used to put their haram much ahead of uh, the time because they are on their way to Makkah Mukarramah. So we'll be putting the haram on, uh, I was saying tamattu means putting on the haram of Umrah during the days of uh, Hajj and then performing the Umrah after Umrah, you take your ihram out, then you be in normal clothing, you are not in ihram anymore, and then you put on the ihram again for hajj. This is called hajj tamattu, and this is what we would be doing. So we'll put the ihram for Umrah from Frankfurt. The method of putting the ihram, if there is a facility of taking the shower, that is the best. If not, don't worry about it, it's not necessary. Make wudu, which is not necessary either. It's sunnah. Make the wudu, perform two rak'ah salah, and when we are performing the two rak'ah salah, the intention will be only of nafil. After salah, for men, of course, as we have the clothing of ihram on now, we will remove the ihram from our head, uncover the head, for men only, and make the intention of doing umrah, and recite labbaik Allahumma labbaik, it's must to recite it once, and it's sunnah to recite it three times at least. One, for sisters, there are no specific clothing except to make sure that whatever has to be covered of the body is covered properly. And making the intention and reciting labbaik. Now the haram have started. All the restrictions that apply to the haram will apply on this person now. Now the best ibadah for this person is to keep on reciting labbaik. لبيك اللهم لبيك لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك. We will arrive at Jeddah inshallah. From there we will go to Makkah Mukarramah and perform our Umrah. As Brother Abdul Wahid was mentioning earlier, once we go to Makkah, of course we get settled in our rooms. Now we go to the Haram. Make sure you remember the name of the gate that you enter the haram from. Remember the number of that gate. Few practical points, especially with our situations, how close we are to the haram. Don't worry taking your slippers to the haram. Keep them at the hotel. Walk barefoot over there. And that is because, number one, to take care of your slippers is something that you have to carry them throughout or if you put them somewhere then you don't know where you have kept them and you may even keep them at the safe place 
and come back and not find them. A lot of things could happen. So therefore, the best thing is, don't take your slippers with you. <coughs> Go to the haram. And then, now, as we are entering the doors of the haram, make the intention of entering the masjid, and recite the dua of entering the masjid, getting closer to the Kaaba, as soon as you have the first look on the Kaaba, get on the side, and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the time of the acceptance of the dua. This is the real time of making the dua. Get on the side, so that we are not on people's way, and make, as, make dua as much as you want. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whatever you need to ask. Now we would proceed, we'll proceed towards the Kaaba. No, until you finish your dua. Now you proceed to the Kaaba. And you will stretch your tawaf from Hajar al Aswad before you arrive over there to make the tawaf. It is sunnah for men, of course, because that is the method of ihram for men that you uncover the right shoulder. Uncover the right shoulder, put the ihram from underneath the right shoulder onto your left shoulder. This is called ittiba. Make the intention once before you arrive, be, uh, get closer to the black stone. Then you make the intention of performing the tawaf for the umrah. Get to the line with the black stone, facing it, raising your hand, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and kiss your hands. This is practically speaking because. The books may say that you go and kiss the black stone. If not, then of course with all the, the crowd at this time, let's not go into that. Let's just talk things that we practically are going to face initially. And then inshallah as we are there, we will talk in other details. So if anyone gets other opportunities, inshallah, uh, they can benefit from them. You started your tawaf for men now because the shoulder is uncovered. They have to do rumel. Ramil means in the first three rounds of the tawaf, you walk like soldiers, moving your shoulders, moving your hands. Not running. It, uh, Ramil doesn't mean run, running. In no way that a person should be running or try to run. It's only just like you're walking, showing your strength. This is sunnah. Details of it will come later on, inshallah. This will continue until three rounds. After the third round, you will stop doing the ramal. Then now you walk normally in the rest of the four rounds. As you do this tilam, you will start walking toward the right hand side. And no one can make mistake of that kind, inshallah, these days because everyone is doing the same thing. The corner before the black stone, before Al Hajar Al Aswad, is called Rukun Yamani. Between Rukun Yamani and the black stone, the best dua to recite is Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhab al nar. Rest of it, dhikr and dua. Istighfar, dhikr and dua. These are the three things that we want to do throughout the tawaf. After you finish the seven rounds of the tawaf, at each round, you will be coming to the, towards the black stone, facing it, Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, kissing your hand, and you continue. So we finish seven rounds. At the end of the seventh round, again, we do the same thing. This is called istilam, which means facing towards the black stone and kissing our hands after saying Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Now, you continue, uh, you have finished your tawaf. Go and perform two rak'ah of tawaf. If you can find place towards Maqam Ibrahim to perform the two rak'ah of tawaf, that is the sunnah, that is the best place. Otherwise, you can do the two rak'ah of tawaf anywhere in the haram or outside of haram. Anywhere you can perform the two rak'ah of tawaf. According to the Hanaf, if there is the makruh time of salah, which means you have done it after asr, then wait, don't do the two rak'ah at that time. Or after fajr, then don't do it at that time until it's the allowable time of salah. After this, proceed towards safa. Things are very easy, inshallah. At this time, as you think about it, okay, i got to remember these things. Don't worry, it will be very easy, inshallah. It's only I'm mentioning it, so at least we have some idea of what we will be doing. We will proceed towards Safa. Over there, as you go climb the mountain of Safa a little bit, it's not too high. Climb over there. And once we are getting towards Safa, towards the mountain, 
recite this ayah. Inna as-safa wal marwata min sha'airillah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he was going there, he said, Abda'u bima bada Allahu bih. I stand with the same thing that Allah started with, which means the ayah uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ayah that talks about Safa and Marwa. The first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Safa and then Marwa. So this is why I said we will also stand with Safa. So saying these words is good too, and then reciting the ayah in the Safa wal Marwa min Sha'ir Allah, you proceed there. And now you will be turning towards the Kaaba, face towards the Kaaba, and raise your hands and make dua. It's sunnah to make dua. This is again the time of the acceptance of dua. So, make the dua. After you make your dua, you finish your dua, you start your sa'i. As you proceed now towards marwa, there are two green marks over there. It's called al-milayn al akhdarain Between these two marks, man should be running. Now, this is not rummel like that rummel. This is not just movement of the shoulder. This is going faster. This is going running a little faster. Not fast running, but just like a person would be jogging. So you'll be going a little faster over there. With all the crowd, you don't get the chance, you don't get it. That's it. But this is the way if you find the rule. And you stop, you step at one green line and you stop at the second green line. The wisdom behind it, reasons, everything, inshallah, we'll talk later on. Continue, you get to Marwa. You, got, you get up over there, face towards the Kaaba, and make dua again as you normally make the dua. After you finish the dua, you're done with the dua. Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, continue. Continue towards Safa now. Now this was one round. It's not going and coming back. It's only going is one round, then from Marwa to Safa is second round. So you started your Sa'i from Safa, and you end your sa'i at marwa. That will be the second round, seventh round. You will end it there. You got over there, come out of the haram, you will see barber shops over there. Go and get, which is called halaq or qasr. Trimming the hair or shaving it off. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encouraged us to shave it. And he made dua for the people who would shave it. He said, Allahumma arham al-muhalliqeen. Ya Allah, have rahmah, mercy on those who have shaved their head. Sahaba Ridwan Allah, those who had cut it short. And their reason for cutting short was totally different than our reason. They didn't want to see their face in the mirror. That wasn't the reason. Or they didn't want to even show it to someone else. Their reason was, when they were at Hudaybiyah and they were stuck, they were hoping they will get the opportunity of getting into Mecca and doing the Umrah. And therefore they said, let's just cut it short. So that if we perform the Umrah, then we are going to shave it. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he himself shaved it. So of course, following him was a greater thing. So therefore, he made the dua, Allahumma arham al-muhalliqeen. Ya Allah, have rahmah on those who have shaved their head. They said, Wal muqassirina ya Rasulullah, about those who cut it short, you make dua for them too, ya Rasulullah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam again repeated the same word, Allahumma arham al-muhalliqeen. Ya Allah, have rahmah on those who have shaved their head. Again, they told him, Wal muqassirin, those who have cut it short too, ya Rasulullah. And again, he says, Allahumma arham al-muhalliqeen. Ya Allah, have rahmah on those who have shaved their head. Three times. And again, they said, Wal muqassirin, ya Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, please, for those also who have cut it short, and then he said, okay, well, muqassireen. Okay, for those who have cut it short too. So therefore, it's the best that to get the maximum benefit of it and get the dua of the Prophet wasallam, we should shave our head. But if a person wants to cut it short, then inshallah, you talk to me later on, uh, I will explain to you how short and what are the restrictions regarding that. After this, your ihram is over. Although you are having the two sheets on you for men, but your haram is over. As far as for sisters, they will be cutting about an inch from the end of their head, or their hair. So about an inch from the end of the hair, and that will take their haram out. Once the haram is out, once you have done this, your haram is off, although you are still in the same clothing. But all the restrictions of the haram are gone now. You are not considered in a haram anymore. These are considered now just normal clothing. Go back and 
change your clothes, do whatever you have to do, and now you are in normal position. Keep on doing as many tawaf as you want while we are in Makkah Mukarramah. Then we will be leaving for Medina Munawwara. In Medina Munawwara, inshallah, during the journey, there is a lot to talk about going to Medina. No restrictions, but adab, respect, and the method of benefiting from it. The time won't allow us now to even touch that topic. And therefore, we will just leave it for them. What to do in Medina? How to make use of the time in Medina Munawwara? All of that, inshallah, we will cover during the journey and when we are there, inshallah. Now, the, the thing that we, rulings that we have to follow is once we are coming back from Medina to Mecca, and that is when we have to put the ihram on again. That is the time when we'll have to put the ihram on. So now you will be, we will be putting the ihram on from Medina Munawwara for Hajj. One good thing, alhamdulillah, you know, there is always advantages and other things. Last year we went to Medina first. And then we went to Mecca, we performed the Umrah, and then we did the Hajj. It is easier. It was much easier. This year we will be going to Mecca first. Then we will go to Medina. The thing that makes me happy about it is, Rasulullah wasallam, he traveled from Medina to Mecca for Hajj. And he put his ihram from there. He did Quran. At that time our Hajj will be... Uh, Ifrad, but we'll talk about more options at that time. But this was the, we are one way getting closer to that method of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this way. He put it on in Zul Hulayfa, and inshallah this is where we will be putting our haram on also from. A place called Zul Hulayfa outside of Medina Munawwara. This will be the haram for Hajj. This is where you will make the intention for uh, having the haram for hajj and then same method uh, putting the haram wearing the clothing uh, performing the two rakah salah making the intention reciting the labbaik and now you started your journey for Makkah Mukarramah with the ihram of hajj we go to Makkah Mukarramah this is not umrah now this is hajj so we will go for uh, as our trip schedule is showing that we will be going for Arafat for, for Mina. It's sunnah to stay in Mina for one day performing five salawat over there, five prayers. So we'll be arriving there anytime before Zuhr on the 8th of Zul Hijjah. On the 8th of Zul Hijjah we will be in Mina performing Salat al Zuhr, Salat al Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and the Fajr of the next day. After the sunrise of the second day, which means now is 9th of Zul Hijjah, we will leave insha'Allah. For Arafat. That is the most important part of the ibadah. Al Hajj al Arafah. Hajj is Arafah. That is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said. So we are heading now towards Arafat. In Arafat, the main ibadah of Arafat is wuquf. After Zawal, we start making dua. Getting busy in dua, in istighfar, in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until the sunset. <coughs> we will be performing Zohar and Asr over there. Those rulings, we will talk about them there, inshallah. At the sunset, now we will leave Arafat without performing Salatul Maghrib. And we will be heading towards Muzdalifah. Whenever we arrive with Dalifa, that will be the time to perform Salatul Maghrib and Isha together over there in Mustalifa. For that day, the time of Maghrib does not start until the time of Isha will start and we have arrived with Dalifa. Except if people will feel that we are missing Salatul Isha now because the time of Fajr is about to get in. Good up. Then we will perform Salatul Maghrib and Isha combine them wherever we are. But the proper thing is if we get into Mustalifa, then that's the time. Even for those who arrive Muzdalifah before the time of Isha would start, the time of Salah have not started yet until the time of Isha would start, then they would combine Maghrib and Isha. With one Adhan and one Iqamah. We won't repeat the Adhan, we won't repeat the Iqamah. After that, we spend the night in Muzdalifah now. This night is in Muzdalifah, and 
it's wajib to be in Muzdalifa for that night. As far as wuquf is concerned, which means doing du'a, uh, uh, prayers, istighfar, whatever, it's the whole night and until the time just before sunrise. From the time we arrive until the beginning time of Fajr is sunnah mu'akkada to do ibadah as much as we can. But it will be a good idea to have some rest too if anyone needs it. Because next day we'll have a lot of things to do. At the beginning time, it's sunnah to perform Salat al-Fajr at the very beginning time in Muzdalifah. And then this is the time when it's wajib to do the wuquf. Until just before the sunrise. Before the sun rises, then we should leave from Muzdalifah towards Mina. Remember on that day, a lot of people and a lot of group leaders, not the Imams, the other leaders, <laughs> the, a lot of people who are not aware of uh, the rulings and the system, what they do is, in order to get in Mina, to get to Mina ahead of others and to uh, be ahead of the crowd, <coughs> they perform Salat al-Fajr before the time. Imagine if people are doing Jummah here before time so they can do anything over there. So, you will see a lot of people, Adhans, you will hear Adhan from all around. Don't go for none of that. Until the time of Fajr would start, then we should do the Salat al-Fajr, and then, so, Sabr, everything is Sabr, because we see a lot of people, they do Salat before time, and then they leave. So the time that was wajib for them to do the Wuquf, they miss that, and they miss the Fard also on top of that. They miss the Salat too. So, they have to be careful about it. In Mina, and now, as we leave from Muzdalifa to Mina, once we arrive Mina, for that day, now this is the 10th of Zulhijjah. On the 10th of Zulhijjah, the first thing we need to do is stoning the shaitan. In Muzdalifah, we should collect the stones for stoning the shaitan. Remember, it's sunnah to collect seven stones from there, although you may collect 70 for all the days. But according to the hadith, Prophet ﷺ collected only seven from there. But remember, you may as well do all 70 because it's difficult to find them in Mina. You won't be able to find them. It's too difficult. So therefore, it's better to do it there. But I'm just mentioning the ruling so we are clear about it. So we collect the stones from here to stone the shaitan. So now once we arrive over there, the first thing we want to do is stone the shaitan. There are three over there. Three places where shaitan tried to stop Ibrahim والسلام, from fulfilling the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he stoned him all three times. So, it's called Jamra Ula, Thani and Aqaba. Small, big and the largest one and the biggest one. On the first day, the tenth, we'll be stoning only one of them. That is Jamra Al Aqaba, the big one. Seven stones at each time that we are stoning the shaitan, Bismillahi Allahu Akbar. And if you remember this dua, that you can memorize it later on, that is, Rajman lil-shaytan wa ridhan lil-rahman. We can do that also, but not necessary. Bismillahi Allahu Akbar and stoning it. When stoning, remember, stoning the shaytan doesn't mean hit it as strongly as you can. It won't hurt him more. <laughs> Just the act, and act, act by itself. And now what it is, is it's a pillar and there is a round wall around it. There is a wall around the pillar. The main thing is, your stone, your pebble that you are throwing at the shaitan should go inside that wall. If you hit it too high or too hard, it's going to hit the pillar and bounce back and fall out of the, that round circle. It's not counted. If it doesn't hit the pillar, it just falls inside that area, it's counted. So that's the main thing, is that make sure that the stone will fall into that area. And that's not too difficult. It's a big area. After this, it's time for us to slaughter the animal. Arrangement for that, we will talk about it later on, inshallah. After this, now, once these two things are done, we can shave our head and 
after shaving the head, the ihram is off. With the exception of one ruling, and that is sexual relationship. Anything connected to that. These things are not allowed other than that. Using normal clothing, perfume, cutting hair, nails, all of this is now allowed. After that, we will be doing tawaf al ziyarah, which is the main tawaf of the hajj. Once that tawaf is done, all the rules of ahram are gone now. Now a person is just like a normal person. But we will not stay in hotel yet. We will not be staying in Makkah yet. Now we are still in Mina. 10th, 11th, 12th, at least three days. And if a person chooses according to his plan and whatever else, stays for the 14th. These are the days when people are supposed to stay in Mina. The main ibadah of those days is stoning the shaitan as far as physical action that can be seen is concerned. But, as we see that that doesn't take too long. And that can't be really everything of the whole day. So, the main thing is Allah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمْ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ When all of these things are done, rituals are done, فَذْكُرُ اللَّهِ كَذِكْرِكُمْ آبَاءَكُمْ Remember Allah as you remember your own parents. As a person who's away from the family for a long time and remember the parents and remember the family the way you remember them, remember Allah that much and even more than that. And then especially in those days they used to get together and now they all will be coming up with poems and stories about their families and everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stopped us from doing all of that and He said, these are the days of dhikrullah, of doing the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And unfortunately, you will see the same jahiliyyah back. We sit over there, on all, and all we are talking about is my business and your business and how we do there and how is communities. No, these are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wiped out those things of the jahiliyyah and He told us, فَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ كَذِكْرِكُمْ أَبَاكُمْ Now, once all of this is done and uh, 10th, 11th, 13th, 14th, uh, 13th, uh, we've we done all of these things. Then, before we leave, we have to do one more tawaf, which is wajib, and that is called tawaf al wada'. This tawaf is wajib. After we have performed this tawaf, we have done everything that we had to do, and we are out. This is in brief the whole journey of the Hajj. Inshallah, as I said, as we go along, we'll keep on talking more details about all of the. Each and everything that we talked about has details to it. And at the more important than this, as I said, is the details of utilizing the trip and making the best use of it so that inshallah, as we come back, we are better people than we have left. And we are better believers and closer relationship and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than we have left with. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of us for this trip and forgive us for every wrong action, word, doings, whatever we have done, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of that and give us tawfiq to make a hajj mabrur, a hajj that is full of reward and be able to refrain from all kind of sins and disobedience and anything that will ruin our hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to be able to do the hajj again and again in our lives. And for those who are not going this year, may Allah give us tawfiq to go next year and keep on going and going and give us tawfiq to always visit those great places and benefit from, them, from visiting them too. Allah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us, accept our efforts and accept all of our prayers. If there are any questions at this time, I think we are late. So if there are any questions... Still, we have two more weeks, inshallah, before we leave. Yeah. That's one quick yes, sure. When men are in the haram, um, you can't wear a jacket or sweater or anything like that. But can you wear like a shawl? Uh, since this question came up, uh, and sometimes it concerns us uh, in preparation for hajj, may be something helpful. And that is, when we say any clothes that are sewn are not allowed during hajj. Remember, it doesn't mean that anything that has stitches on it is not allowed. So if uh, your watch belt has a stitches, it's not allowed, or your slippers have stitches, they are not allowed. This is not what it means. It means wearing regular clothing that are sewn to fit a human being wearing it in certain place. If someone has a jacket, and he puts his jacket on top of him without putting the sleeves in, even that is okay. Sleeping bags are sewn. But they are okay. So, 
anything that is sewn in a way that it could be dressed, those things cannot be dressed in that form of dressing it. Other than that, the stitches, sewn and everything, the, all of those things are okay. Shawl is okay. Niyat for Hajj Badal. That you make the intention of doing the Hajj on behalf of the person that you are going to be doing the Hajj for. So at every step when you make the intention, you make the intention on behalf of that person that I'm doing this on behalf of such and such person. From the time you put your ihram on, you will be making the intention of making it on behalf of that person. Tawaf, you're studying it, make the intention of doing it on behalf of that person. You're studying the sign, make the intention of you're doing it on behalf of that person. You are sacrificing the animal, make sure that you make the intention that it is on behalf of that person for whom you are doing that hajj. That's the easiest thing to say, and there are more details that inshallah you can find out.